And I'll invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 32 to 34. Just a few moments. I think I failed to mention earlier, we will receive the foreign missions offering on your way out this morning. Uh, On your way out, you'll be able to give uh, to the foreign mission offering on your way out. Luke chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 32 to 34. So let's think about blind spots, particularly blind spots when you're driving. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? All you drivers aware of that, I hope. I mean, that's, that's a real problem if you're not aware of the blind spots. Uh, a blind spot is that spot that you, as you're driving down the road, can't see. It's kind of like somewhere in here or somewhere in here. Your mirrors take care of what's directly behind. Your side view mirror can catch some of it. You kind of can see right here, but then there's a spot you can't see, right? And they can be very dangerous when you're driving. How many of you have about or maybe gone all the way over in the lane and hit somebody? Okay, there was a, there's a taker back there. I believe the way he raised his hand, I'm pretty sure he hit the person. Um, so that, that happens. Um, this is such a big, I mean, it's dangerous. It's such a big deal. Most car manufacturers have now made it almost standard, right, uh, on the newer vehicles that there's, I don't know if this is what they call it or not, but a blind spot sensor. So when somebody's in your blind spot, your, your whatever side of the car, something flashes in your side view mirror, and you hear something, deep, 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 deep. As long as they're in that blind spot region of your vehicle, that thing's going off, right? That's, a, that's an awesome thing. Uh, I, I don't have that on my vehicle, but we were on a trip somewhere and, and rented a truck, and, and man, that thing's, that thing's talking to me. You know, it's doing all this stuff for me. Uh, And they steer for you. I'm not so sure what I like about that sometimes. But no doubt, those devices have saved drivers from many accidents. Well, God's Word serves as a blind spot sensor in our lives, doesn't it? For our hearts and lives by pointing out our spiritual blind spots. It helps us avoid wrecking our lives if, here's the catch, If we've got the sensor turned on, which means if we know what the Word says about our blind spots. And I'm just going to be honest with you. The more I listen to Jesus talking about money in Luke's gospel, it seems to me that materialism and the love of money is an ongoing potential blind spot in my life and I would dare say in the, most of Amer- in, in, the, in the lives of most American churchgoers. And this is a major deal. Let's just get that on the table to begin with. It's a big deal that the love of money and materialism is a blind spot for most of us. Because as David Platt puts it, if our lives do not reflect radical compassion for the poor, there is reason to question just how effective we will be in declaring the glory of Christ to the ends of the earth. More pointedly, if our lives do not reflect radical compassion for the poor, there is reason to wonder if Christ is really in us at all. Now, if that's true, that's a big deal. If that's true, then ignoring the blind spot, not programming your blind spot sensor to see your own love of money or materialism could land you in a devil's hell all the while through this life you think you're headed to heaven. So let's turn on. God's blind spot sensor by opening his word to Luke 12. We're in the middle of a series, or at the end of the series, called How to Be Rich Toward God, taken straight from the language of Jesus, where he's describing the, the telling the story of the, the, the rich fool and, and the reality that he was so foolish because he stored up treasure for himself and was not rich toward God. So that just helps us when we figure out right quick what we need to learn. 
it got the rich fool dead, right? So that thing of storing up treasure for yourself, that th- this idea of not being rich toward God, that's where we don't want to be. So that means we want to learn how to be rich toward God. And that's what we've been unpacking in Luke 12, 13 to 34. Two weeks ago, we, saw, uh, we, we talked about guarding against greed. And we saw there that we can guard against the foolishness of greed by believing. How? By believing that treasuring God is real life. Well, it's not about stuff, it's about Him. And then last week, we talked about trusting our Father for our needs there in Luke 12, 22 to 31. And we, we learned that we can trust our good Father to meet our needs and live, therefore, live in a focused pursuit of His kingdom priorities in our lives. We, we don't have to worry about everything in our lives. We can focus on what He's called us to focus on, and that is His kingdom his righteousness, the Great Commission, all that He's called us as His people to do, we can really give our lives there, and He, our good Father, will meet our needs and care for us. And this morning, we wrap it up with verses 32 to 34, and we learn that the third way that we're to be rich toward God is is, is to give to the needy. So we're talking about this morning, giving to the needy. And here's the take-home truth. This is a long one. I realize that, but just stay with me. Listen to the words. Try to catch it. And understand what Jesus is saying in these three simple verses. These verses teach us this. We don't have to be afraid to sacrificially give to those in spiritual and physical need. For God delights to give us His eternal kingdom even as we store up eternal dividends for ourselves. We don't have to be afraid to sacrificially give to both those in spiritual and physical need because our God delights to give us His kingdom. We'll talk about what all this means later. To give us His eternal kingdom. And while we're giving sacrificially, you know what we're doing? According to Jesus, we're storing up eternal dividends for ourselves. Now, this is a winning scenario for us. It's a winning scenario, listen to me, for eternity. Giving to the needy, trusting our Father, welcoming the gift of the kingdom that He gives to us, even as we give to the needy, will earn for us eternal dividends. You ever heard of of such? Does anything that you know about pay eternal dividends? Hello? Nope. I'm fixing to tell you the most valuable investment you can ever make. It's right here. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus said, Fear not, little flock. Interesting. This is the only place in the New Testament Jesus addresses his disciples and us as his people as little flock. What a precious term that is, isn't it? How how, how tender and and, 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 and just what what a sweet thing to be called by Jesus, little flock. Fear not. He he loves us. He's comforting us from the very beginning. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Wow. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure, great delight to give you the kingdom. So what does that mean? Sell your possessions. And give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old. With a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Summarize it all. We don't have to be afraid to sacrificially give to those in spiritual and physical need because God delights to give us His kingdom, His eternal, everlasting kingdom, even as we store up for ourselves eternal dividends. There's five things I want you to see from these three verses this morning. First of all, in verse 32, fear keeps us from true kingdom giving. I want you to leave today with with, with an understanding of what true kingdom giving is. Not only that, I want you to leave here today committed to be true kingdom givers. That's the goal of this message, okay? Is that up front enough? That's, That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for me and Betsy in our giving. But fear 
we see, first of all, keeps us from true kingdom giving. Or why else would Jesus have said, fear not, little flock, right before he tells us to sell our stuff and give? There's a fear factor in giving. Fear keeps us from true kingdom giving. Fear not, little flock. For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This whole chapter, by the way, has been one encouragement after another to fear not or don't be anxious. Let's, let's run through it again. Verse 4 of chapter 12 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. And he goes on to tell why. Because God is the one you're to fear. The one who can kill your, soul, your body, but also your soul. Do not fear those who kill the body. Verse 11. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious. Real kin to fear, isn't it? Do not be anxious how or what you are to answer or what you are to say, as Jesus goes on to say, because the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Verse 22. Do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat, or about your body, what you you shall put on. And he gives those illustrations that we read. God God feeds the ravens. God clothes the the lilies. Don't you think he can take care of you? Don't you think he'll, he'll provide for you? Verse 29, do not seek what you are to eat or, and, and what you are to drink, nor be of anxious mind. Another way of saying, don't be afraid about life and, and, and your daily needs. Or, on the other hand, don't obsess about the stuff that God will give you that you need, but don't make it a priority. Focus on the kingdom, he says. Because he knows you need all that and he'll take care of you. And now, verse 32 Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear keeps us from being true kingdom givers. In verse 32, I want you to see the images that are, that are, that are there in just that one sentence about who God is. The, 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 the pictures of God that are painted in this one verse. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. How many of you can find, real quick, three pictures of God, three images of God from that verse? God is a blank. Three things. This is, this is a, a good lesson in Bible study. Okay, but, let, but, but it's real specific based on the words that are used. Fear not, little flock. What a, hey, now, all right, I got you now. Y'all are, y'all are awake now. We're good. God is a good shepherd. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure. I mean, that's a giveaway, right? He just told you who he is. He's his father. To give you the kingdom, he's a king. In, in Luke 12, 32, God is our watchful shepherd. He is our almighty king, and he's our tender Father, J.D. Greer calls this God's trifecta of assurance. He wants you to know He loves you. He wants to motivate your generous and radical and sacrificial giving to the spiritually and physically needy from the basis of the gospel that He loves you and gave His own Son to die for you. And He wants to give you His kingdom. And he's your shepherd that takes care of you and me when I'm dumb. Because we are, hello. He's a good, good father. He's a gentle and caring and watchful shepherd. And he is an almighty king. Here's the deal. If he tells you to do something, he's got the power to give you what you need to get it done. Jesus says, fear not, because he knows the Father's heart, that he delights to give you the kingdom of God. You see, fear is really a lack of trust in the goodness of our Father. It's questioning that whole song Jason sang, when we have a heart full of fear. It's a lack of trust in the goodness of our Father to, to want to take care of us, And to be able to do it. It's a lack of trust in the power of our king. 
to be able to provide for us and to know how to best order and dictate our lives for our good and His glory. And it's a lack of trust, fear is, in our shepherd to know what's best for us, to lead us in the right paths, to get us to the food and water our souls need, to protect us from wolves and other predators and enemies that would devour our lives. We know his name is Satan, and they're called demons. And even to shepherd us and help us deal with our own sinful nature called the flesh. That's what fear is. It's a lack of trust. And in this context, it's all about fear. Stay with me. Don't miss this. It's all about fear when it comes to generously, more than that, sacrificially giving our money to meet the needs of those who are spiritually and or physically without what they need. That means food and clothing physically. That means the gospel spiritually. Now, let's just be clear. And let's just be real. We don't say that we're afraid when we don't give radically and sacrificially. No, we don't say that. We don't just say it out loud, hey, I don't, I don't trust God enough to give that way. We're more, we're, we're more refined and religious than that, aren't we? We don't say that we don't trust our Father, our Shepherd, and our King. We hide our fear under the guise of financial wisdom and prudence. And given like you're talking about, Jesus, that just don't make sense. It's not wise. But fear keeps us from true kingdom giving. Secondly, I want you to see, though, that our Father's good pleasure to give us His kingdom eliminates fear. When you leave here today, there's no excuse for living in fear and not being a true kingdom giver who gives sacrificially. Our good Father's Our Father's good pleasure to give us His kingdom eliminates fear. The rest of verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for... Here's why you don't have to fear. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What does that mean? Sounds amazing. I don't have to fear because He wants to give me the kingdom. But what does that mean that He wants to give me the kingdom? I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't live in a palace. I don't have a throne. Well, what does that mean? Romans 14, 17, Paul tells us what the kingdom of God is all about. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's about the heart of God. He wants to give us Himself. And He wants us to live even as Christ lived which is the happiest of all possible lives. So our Father, when when, when Jesus says, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Jesus is saying, it's your Father's great delight, it's His highest joy, it's the deepest desire of His heart to give you the kingdom. He's saying that our Father wants to produce righteousness, peace, and joy by His Holy Spirit in our lives. And again, in our context, in Luke 12, 32-34, our Father delights to give us the ability to be true kingdom givers so that we reap eternal in dividends from our investments. God wants to make us true kingdom givers so that we reap eternal dividends on our money investments as we give to the spiritually and physically poor of our world. You know, it's interesting, Paul addresses this very thing in a little different terms. That it's our, good fa- our Father's good pleasure to give us His kingdom and how that eliminates fear. Over in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6-11. through 11. By the way, two chapters here in the middle of 2 Corinthians, chapters 8 and 9. Some of those powerful teaching on giving. Challenging words about our giving that, that you find in all of Scripture. But in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 Paul says, the point is this, 
Whoever sows sparingly, we're talking about giving here, don't miss this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's talking about money. It's talking about when you give generously, you reap generously. If, you, if, you, if, if you're stingy in your giving, that's, that's, that's what your harvest is going to look like. Because here's the deal, if you sow a lot of seed, you get a big harvest, right? That's what God's saying. Each one, verse 7, must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Now, there's a lot of alls and everys and always is in that, in that verse. A lot of superlatives. One of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture about your giving, here's what, here's what God's saying. You reap what you sow. If you give big, you, you'll, 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 you'll reap the harvest of the kingdom big. And here's the thing. We're not talking about being guilted into giving. I pray that you've never heard me or never will hear me try to guilt you into giving. It's not about that. God loves a cheerful giver. And here's the deal. You ought to be a cheerful giver. Why? Because the Father loves you. He's your, he's your Father. He's your Shepherd. He's your King. Jesus is your Savior. Why will we not cheerfully give to the God who gave us everything He had, even the life of His own Son? I mean, grace motivates there's no, there's no need for a guilt trip. Grace motivates us to give. Amen? We want to give. But then it says in verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. This whole, that whole verse is about giving to a need. Giving to spiritually needy people. Giving to physically needy people. In this case, uh, it, it, was, it was the, the, the believers um, that... that that were under persecution, that needed, uh, they were just being basically starved to death uh, societally because of their uh, faith in Christ, and, and, and it was about providing for them. But what that verse tells us is this. If you'll trust God, who is your father, your shepherd, and your king, every opportunity you have to give, you will be enabled to give by God. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't put the alls and the everys in there. Do we believe the, the, the literal word of God? Do we believe exactly what God says to us through the Apostle Paul? God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And, and, and abound is a big word, isn't it? Yeah. That doesn't mean you can just kind of, you know, flip a fiver in the plate. I mean, I mean it, it means you can... You can give more than you think you can give because God is your supply. As it is written, he's distributed freely. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Listen, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, who's that? God. Will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness in giving. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. I, I, again, Paul said this. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. That is, as they took the gift up to the churches in Jerusalem that were being persecuted. It will result in God's glory. You see, we don't have to fear being true kingdom givers. Our fathers got this. How many times have you not given are given stingily or tokenly to a need that would benefit the life of someone physically or spiritually because you were afraid you didn't have enough. You know, see, the question is, how much is enough? Right? Our Father's good pleasure to give us His kingdom eliminates fear. Here's the bottom line. If I don't give generously, if I don't give sacrificially, then what I'm saying about my father is, I like him, but I just don't trust him. Appreciate salvation, God. 
You took care of my soul for eternity. You sent your son to die. I don't have to worry about ever being under condemnation again. There is therefore now no condemnation for anybody who's in Christ Jesus. You've told me I've got eternal life with you in heaven. You've told me that, that Jesus, that you went ahead of me to prepare a place. You're coming back. You're going to take me home. I, I, I've got an address in heaven. But God, you cannot handle giving me what I need so that I can do what you said for me to do, which is give radically and even sacrificially in this world. You see how dumb that is when I think that way and talk that way? That's just plain. Let me kind of say it. That's plain stupidity. We've just told God, you've done the biggest thing the universe has ever seen, and that is save sinners, but you can't handle some dollar bills. Wow. And thus, the blind spot of materialism and the love of money begins to surface and we see what's going on in here. Thirdly, true kingdom giving, let's talk about what it is, is limiting our wealth by sacrificially giving to those with great spiritual and physical needs. How many of you like that definition of true kingdom giving? How many of you are hoping, just hoping? You were just dying and hoping that's exactly how we were going to find from the Word of God true kingdom giving. Nope. Nope. But it's here in the words of Jesus. True kingdom giving is limiting our wealth intentionally by sacrificially giving to those with great spiritual and physical needs. Jesus said, right after he said, fear not, little flock, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here's what he says that means. Here's what practical steps are to be taken in response to that amazing truth. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Hello. See, this society wasn't a big cash society like ours is. They didn't have the stock market and investments and, 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 and a, lot, a lot of money. They had currency. I, I understand that. But in that day, so much of their wealth was possessions, stuff, food, you know, property, all this kind of thing. And so Jesus just, just goes right to it and sell your possessions and give to the needy. I mean, because you're God's little flock, you're, you're, you're my precious sheep, and because my Father wants to give you a kingdom that will never end, which, by the way, is way bigger than the kingdoms we build with any money or stuff here. That's the, that's the contrast. That's the point. Then, then, then here's how we should live as Christians. This is just natural, Jesus said. This, is, this, is the, this should be our default. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. That's not an optional suggestion. That's an imperative in the Greek language. It's a command. A command given by the one who lived, died, and rose again for your salvation and mine. True kingdom giving is limiting our wealth by sacrificially giving to those with great spiritual and physical need. You say, where's this limiting our wealth, intentionally limiting our wealth? Because you're choosing to sell your stuff and give it. When you do that, you take away from what you keep and you give it. Right? True kingdom of giving is limiting our wealth by sacrificially giving, with, giving to those with great spiritual and physical needs. But fourthly, notice in, at the, in, in verse 33 also, true kingdom giving builds eternal dividends for us. We've already talked about this, but I want us to really kind of kind of kind of just meditate on this. Jesus goes on, sell your, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide for yourselves, <coughs> provide, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old and with treasure that, uh, in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches or moth destroys. Now remember, again, true kingdom giving builds eternal dividends for us. But, but remember what true kingdom giving is. It's limiting on purpose our wealth by giving sacrificially to those in spiritual and physical needs. So true kingdom giving, that kind of giving, builds eternal dividends for us. You know, your earthly possessions can be stolen, can't they? How many of you have ever been robbed? I bet there's somebody in the room. I see several hands go up. I mean, I mean, there you go. Just, just in case you wondered if that could actually happen, there's several people in the room who can tell you hey, it happens. People rob you. Your earthly possessions wear out, don't they? Most everything eventually decays. Somehow. But everything, in the end, 
will be destroyed. Everything that we possess today in this world when Jesus returns to take us home and simultaneously judge the world, the scriptures say it'll be consumed by fire. It, it, it's going to be completely burned. And in and, and, and that same moment, don't know how this is all going to happen, he's going to remake the heavens and the earth and we'll live forever in the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. But the stuff of today, gone. Gone. Burned. But the heavenly earnings on true kingdom giving of your money, your time, and other resources cannot be stolen, Jesus said, and will never decay and will never be destroyed. Now here's the deal. There are zero earthly investments that will pay eternal dividends. They don't exist. Your stock market investments will cease to pay the dividends when you and yours die or when Jesus returns. I understand those dividends could outlast you for your family. You've got beneficiaries. I understand how that works. But, but here's the deal. Some, sometimes, someday, they're going to stop paying. If nothing else when Jesus comes back. Your real estate investments will cease to provide a return when you and yours die or Jesus comes home, comes back to take us home. But listen, don't miss this. The earthly investments you make now in the meeting of people's spiritual and physical needs will pay you for eternity. Jesus says that. For eternity. And again, don't miss this. Jesus gives us a command to go after those heavenly money bags. Provide yourselves with. It's a command. Just like sell your stuff was a command. This is a command. Provide yourselves. I'm telling you. I'm commanding you. This is how my people live. They sell their stuff and they give. They run after. They pursue heavenly money bags. Eternal dividends. Again, it's not just an incidental result of this kind of giving, but such eternal riches are to be an intentional pursuit. Jesus wants you to have dividends that pay forever. He wants you to invest well in stuff that will pay you forever. Now here's the deal. We got a financial advisor. We, you know, you, you guys got bankers and and finance and and, and, and hey, I'll, we like ours. I mean, he's he's good. He's he's helped us with with investments. But here's the thing: he's never helped me with an investment that will pay eternal dividends. Never. What do you think about Jesus? You like him? You think he's smart? You think he's got good good ideas, good wisdom? He's telling us how to live and invest our lives and our money. Best, best financial advisor there is because he's God. Hello? And he's telling you how to get eternal dividends. So here's the deal. To fail, to invest in what will pay you eternal dividends is one, plain dumb again, right? We're back to dumb. If you know how to get eternal dividends and you don't do it, I mean, you're just dumb. I'm just stupid. Why would I not do that? I, I mean, here's the thing. If I could tell you today that if you, if you, actually, let's go back 10 years. Our son heard of this thing 10 years ago called Bitcoin. And he told his mama, he said, I think I'm going to buy some of that. She said, son, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. What is Bitcoin? I mean, that's just one of these little fatty things, you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the boy would be retiring. Jesus can't lie to you. There's no risk in dividends happening in your life forever if you'll simply do what Jesus said. I mean, it's guaranteed. Like nothing's ever been guaranteed in any investment you've ever made. 
Do you believe him? True kingdom giving builds eternal dividends for us. And finally, in verse 34, true kingdom giving reveals that we are actually in God's kingdom. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's the bottom line. If your heart's not in the kingdom, if your heart's not about the kingdom stuff, God's kingdom stuff, if your heart's not about what God's heart's about, then you may not be in the kingdom. You may just be a church member. You may just have your name on a roll. You may just attend a, 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 some services, whatever. But you're not part of the kingdom of God. If your heart's not in heaven, if your heart's not in the kingdom, if the kingdom doesn't drive your heart and, and, and dictate your behavior. Again, remember what true kingdom giving is? Limiting our wealth according to Jesus' two commands by sacrificially giving to those with great spiritual and physical needs. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide for yourselves money bags that will never wear out in heaven. So no matter what we say, no matter how, we, how good we look on a Sunday morning, don't miss this, guys. No matter how busy you are with church stuff, according to Jesus, if we neglect the poor, both spiritually poor and physically poor, if we neglect to give sacrificially to them, we reveal that our hearts don't beat with the heart of God's Spirit. And thus, we reveal that we are not in the kingdom of God. True kingdom giving reveals that we are actually in God's kingdom. This is what God's people do, Jesus said. You see, we don't have to be afraid to sacrificially give to those in spiritual and physical need for God delights to give us his eternal kingdom even as we store up eternal dividends for ourselves. Pastor David Platt tells a story of a wealthier man in his church. I'm, I'm pretty sure this would have been his church over in Birmingham when he was still there. He now pastors at McLean Bible Church in D.C. But he tells the story of a wealthier man in, in his church that came to his office one day. After we'd been studying, he says the story of the rich young man. He sat down, looked at me, and said point blank, I think you're crazy for saying some of the things you're saying. Now, let me, can I just tell you, that when, when these conversations happen in a pastor's office, it's a very tense moment. You don't know how this is going to go. And, and David Platt says, I had no idea what was fixing to happen. But he continued. But I think you're right. I think you're crazy, but I think you're right. And so now I think I'm crazy, the man said, for thinking some of the things I'm thinking. And for the next few minutes, he described to David Platt how he was selling his large house and had decided to give away many of his other possessions. He talked about the needs he wanted to invest his resources in for the glory of Christ. And then David Platt says he looked at me after that through tears in his eyes and he said, I wonder at some points if I'm being irresponsible or unwise. Listen, do not miss with this statement. But then I realize there is never going to come a day when I stand before God and he looks at me and says, I wish you would have kept more for yourself. And he finished the conversation by saying, I'm confident that God will take care of me. Simple question, are you? Am I? Can God take care of me well enough that I can obey Jesus, his son, who died for me? And sell stuff and give to the poor. Sacrificially. Big giving. That, that statement, I mean, I just I sat there and thought about that for a while when I came across that this week. There is never going to come a day when I stand before God and he looks at me and says, I wish you would have kept more for yourself. There is never going to be a day when God says to me, I wished you had kept more 
for yourself. Wow. We, 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 don't, we, just, we, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid to sacrificially give to those in spiritual and physical need for our Father delights to give us His eternal kingdom. Even, even as He enables us to store up eternal dividends for Himself. Ask God what He wants you to do. But it's only scary if you don't know who your Father is. Amen? Your father, fear not, little flock, your father, it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, you're going, some of you are going to say, well, I mean, there's no way I can give 51% of my income. I can't live on half of what I make. Okay, that's fine. Some of you can. Some of us in the room could. The question is, what is God? Will you ask him? Will you ask your good father? What needs to change? Somehow we've got in our minds that 10% of our bringing home pay, we're good with God. First of all, I don't know where in the Bible we ever find that. Even in the Old Testament, it was more than 10%, just for the record. Here's the point of the New Testament. God gave you His Son. He sacrificially gave you His Son. 10% doesn't come close to what we ought to give for the kingdom. By the way, if the average church member did, if every average church member gave 10%, the church would have more, every local church would have more money than you knew what to do with. But what if you gave 20? What if you gave 25%? And you catch what they said? Their focus is on unreached people groups. Why? Last week we talked about the physically poor. We saw, we heard a report from... um, Alan Treble with the Gilmer Food Pantry. Those who need, in this county, need food to eat. So if you want to meet a a physical need, give to the Gilmer Food Pantry. 60% of all school children in Gilmer County qualify for food assistance. That's two-thirds. Two out of every three children in this county need food. But the reason we talk about unreached people groups is because what does that mean? They're starving for the gospel. They've never heard it. They live in places and among peoples where the gospel has never been preached. They've never even heard the name of Jesus. They are as bankrupt spiritually before God as they can possibly be. And so right now, three of our missionaries serve the unreached. In my daughter's case, she serves the missionaries by teaching their children that serve The unreached. What adjustments in your finances need to be changed today? Are we all clear? I don't want anybody to leave this room today and say, that preacher, all he wants is my money. Let me tell you, I haven't haven't mentioned East LJ Baptist Church in your giving. Now, if you're a believer, there's there's a thing with your local church. But, But what have I talked about today? I've told you to give to the Gilmer Food Pantry and to missions. So if you give stuff to this mission offering we're taking today, we, we keep zero dollars of it. It goes to all of it goes to our missionaries. And here's the reason I'm not talking about East LJ's finances, because God, again, does not want you to be guilted, pressured, or any of that into giving. He wants you to joyfully, gladly, hilariously, the word means in Second Corinthians, give. And God can take care of his church. He can take care of it better if everybody was giving like the scriptures tell us, cheerfully, generously. What adjustments in your finances need to be changed today? Let's pray.